Michael Cardy is a director of the Australian practice of McGregor Coxall, who worked in the Antipodes before coming back to the UK in 2016, when one of the first projects he worked on was the competition for smart cities organised by the NLA's city centre. So, uh, Michael, can you start by telling me a bit about that project and how it informs your ideas of streets? Yeah, it's, I mean, it was a really great project to kick off our time in the UK. Um, the UK, flying back from Australia uh, as a new business, comes with its challenges. Um, the UK is known for its network. Um, it obviously requires a, a strong local track record when you're trying to win work. Um, and then that's why the beauty of a competition is it kind of levels the playing field and allows you to be innovative and put some bold ideas out there and, and see if they stick. And the Smarter Cities competition that was run by the NLA was a really exciting avenue for us to pursue as a business because it allowed us to investigate future public spaces, the buildings and city infrastructure. And, and in particular, because the project was focused on the city of London, we felt that the street was a fascinating area to look at, um, especially when the city of London deals with such an influx in population on a day-to-day -day basis. It's kind of crammed with people in the morning and afternoon and then kind of dead in the evenings. And so when we were looking at City London with our, our consultant partners, we identified Cheapside as a really significant street, yet kind of encapsulates these challenges. And so we posed the question um, as almost our kind of our prompt to how we're going to solve it. And that was, what if Cheapside could adapt to the changing demands and become a destination in its own right? And, and how can it start to support public life when its function as a vehicular link is becoming less of a priority? And, and so with that, we kind of proposed with, within the smart city kind of genre, we were looking at what we called the smart carpet. And that was really challenging the conception of what a street can function like on a day-to-day -day basis it was looking at a living a thinking surface treatment that had the ability to adapt and respond to the user's demands it, it comprised of paving modules modular furniture systems intelligent multifunctional systems energy systems interlockable furniture and and really sensory recognition so that we understand how the street and space is performing in the future um, and what the aim of this really was, was creating a street that had the ability to change function from maybe a commuter traffic corridor in the morning, which with still uh, accommodating people, transforming into a, a recreational space at lunch, lunchtime, accommodating social interaction and dining in the evenings, and then maybe cultural activation in a later nighttime. It's a 24 hour street that has that ability to function throughout the day and change to the user's demands. And, it was bold and it is, it is progressing existing technologies, but the fundamental principles are applicable to every street we should be looking at now. That's looking at first, the streets need to be seen as public spaces. You know, they accommodate almost 35% of most cities, yet they're primarily focused on mobility and movement, yet they can be places for people to congregate, hang out, um, environmental resilience to be improved. So. We should be really looking at our streets more as linear public space typologies and, and really responding to their unique context, which is the buildings and obviously the culture and the communities that abound them. We need to be looking at spatial adaptation um, and how can streets become adaptable platforms for different uses. Um, and that means it can be changing function, whether it be on a seasonal basis, a monthly basis, weekly basis, or a day basis, but that ability for a space to be transient and ever changing is a really important component to street design. Multifunctionality as well, um, I have to say is key. Um, we, we tend to design things as a monofunctional programmatic space. And if we start to look at it multifunctional, we can start to accommodate social programs, economic programs, environmental programs that, that make the space lively and diverse. And I guess the last two, and they're kind of really intertwined, is, is empowering and engaging communities in the curation of street design, because they ultimately are the people that use these spaces. So bringing communities on board instills a, a sense of civic pride, which I think is really important, and in, not just in streets, but I guess in design full stop. Um, but also, we are a 21st century city now, and we have access to technology. And although I'm not an advocate of technology driving the agenda, I think we can use technology as a perfect tool to 
map and understand how spaces are performing and use that metric data to understand what's working and what's not and therefore create a better solution off the back of it. Yes, well, of course, public realm is moving up the agenda as a response to the coronavirus pandemic. So how do you think authorities should be responding now to ensure that those living in high density cities have the appropriate access to space and particularly, of course, green space? Yeah, it's I mean, it's it's interesting that pandemics um, are challenging society today and they're negatively challenging it, but also they're creating a huge opportunity. Um, and I think if you only have to go through the archives and see previous pandemics, urban society has always evolved and changed really quickly. It's, it's look, you've looked at improvements to ventilation, drainage systems, sewage systems, streets and parks have established, been established. So COVID-19 is actually placing a real spotlight on um, ensuring accessible green space in dense cities. But I think if you kind of go to the root challenge of creating quality open space in dense cities you kind of have to go straight forward to the the planning system and look at the planning standard itself and when you start to dig deep and look at the planning standards um, for open space they are they well they were conceived in the 1920s the original quantitative uh, standards and really over the past hundred years it's only been slightly tweaked and changed and adapted as societies kind of grown um, and, and this rudimentary approach really is kind of failing to respond to this 21st century high density living. Um, it's, not re it's not really needs based because it's based on very much basic statistics and just a, a ratio. And it's, and it's not really conceiving the variety of public open space that really is available today, um, such as streets, as we just talked about. So I think open space planning standards need to be um, re-looked at quite radically. I think there's a lack of funding, um, you know, over the last five, maybe 10 years, you know, through, through austerity, parks and open space have been the first to be cut. And, uh, and unfortunately with that, it's created a lot of open space that's in disrepair and not really supporting the, the community around it. And also, if we just look at the strange simplicity of open space, it's always been perceived as, a, as an island in a, in a sea of gray infrastructure. And I think that in lies the real rethink is we can't be seeing parks as little pockets of spaces that support people around it we need to try and embed it and integrate it into our city environment and so i i, I really think that if we start to reconceive the city through its blue and green infrastructure which allows us to look at more the holistic and systematic components of a city a broader range we can re-manage the open space planning standard in, in that, that way um, and that means, you know, looking at it as, as part of active lifestyle, active travel, you know, sociability of spaces, cultural um, connectedness, looking at interconnectivity. And so how, how are they all relating and linking together? So you're not kind of having to travel through three motorways to get to an open space. You know, it's kind of like it's, it's part of a journey that you're just going to a different open space typology. Um, so I think with that kind of diversification of open space typologies we can we can definitely bring streets in there that's that's 35 percent of space in a city that could be reallocated and rethought immediately um and then you've got roofscapes you've got waterscapes you've also got all these disused pieces of urban infrastructure that sit there vacant not used so there's a lot of untapped potential in a city that we should be rethinking it. We, if we t take the typical traditional approach, it's 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 cutting tiny corners, you know. So we're going to be looking at, well, let's reduce this open space ratio to 1.28 hectares per thousand people, and you know, you need to do something quite radical. And COVID-19 presents the opportunity, and and I think if they can invest in, put adequate money into the parks and open spaces and the blue green infrastructure, they can change the planning system. They bring the communities and the stakeholders involved. And they, as I touched on before, bring in technology and data and GIS mapping, then you can get a far more intelligent outcome to our public space allocation. Yeah, great. So um, one of the things that McGregor Coxall has done is set up a BioCity research studio. So what's that about and how does it inform uh, your work? So, I mean, McGregor Coxall's been structured around three disciplines that's landscape architecture urbanism and environment 
And the BioCity research engine is, is essentially the core of the business. It's kind of like the heartbeat of how we operate. Um, and, and its kind of creation was in recognition to the city's need of disruptive smart solutions to tackle the global problems we're facing. And so uh, in 2006, the studio was kind of developed and it was developed as a way of one, um, embedding it within our projects. So there's always kind of urban trends and thought leadership has been underpinned and integrated in all our work. But also we're partnering up with universities, NGOs, industry, you know, consultants, investors, governments, all in a way, to, and competitions um, like, we, like we did for the Smart City competition. We use them as, as ways of kind of researching, investigating these future trends and embedding them in our projects. Um, and then underpinning BioCity is what we call bio-urbanism. And this is developed as a large scale open source systems based planning framework. So it's kind of like taking an entire city and breaking it up into a series of systems and looking at how those systems all operate in balance with each other. And the idea is that it's fostering regenerative relationships between the cities and the biological systems in which they depend. So rather than seeing the city and the natural environment as two separate components, we're embedding them together as one and that's creating a more balanced outcome. And, and the 10 systems that we, uh, I guess, frame our work in is, is uh, I've kind of been uh, broken down into uh, five biosystems and five urban systems. The biosystems are food, people, landscape, waste, and water. And the urban systems are economy, energy, mobility, urban form, and technology. And each of these systems measures the environmental performance of a project or a city against science-based targets and global best practice indicators. And then that allows us to bring in real intelligence into our projects. Um, and, and we do that through a dashboard, a, a BioCity dashboard. So all this, this data from our projects is brought together and it allows us to understand if everything's working together in a relative balance. It doesn't mean say every project has the same metrics. It's more the fact that if there's something inadequately supported in our design, then we will make sure it's been responded to. Um, and, and the beauty of it is we take all this information that's kind of from like projects in the Middle East, China, Australia, the UK, and we can start to compare the data and understand what's working and what's not in different cultural environments. Yeah, that sounds great. So uh, looking at the uh, pandemic, what, what are the key changes do you think as an urbanist like yourself that you'll need to address as, as we as we come out of uh, COVID-19? Well, I think COVID-19 has obviously shone a real strong lens on the importance of social health and well-being. Um, and, it, and it is, uh, as I said earlier, presenting a real bold opportunity for um, authorities to act very boldly um, in, in trying to radically rethink how the urban infrastructure is conceived. And that's looking at streets, obviously mobility and social spaces and the value of green and blue infrastructure. Um, so it, basically everything I said before responds to it. But then the, the thing that COVID-19 uh, hopefully isn't masking is climate change and the importance of the environment. And mm. COVID-19 has, has evidently reduced emissions and pollution has gone down and people are living in a more kind of flexible lifestyle, which is a lot of benefits. And, you know, straight away we can take some real learnings from this to apply to our cities and therefore that will start to reduce some of the emissions but under still underneath the surface there's a growing problem actually during COVID-19 there's been an increase in deforestation in comparison there's been an increase in poaching and there's an increase in still illegal mining so we can't like hide uh, away the real challenge is climate change and how do we resolve that and we need to start to look at um responding globally across that um, we need to accelerate each of our city's environmental performance um, it, and, the, and the guess COVID-19 has highlighted that areas with high obesity high air pollution tend to have strong correlations with um, health impacts and deaths so the performance metrics of how cities are kind of looking in the future is going to have to be positive it's going to entice people to want to stay and live there 
but we also, as a, as a business that's operating in Australia um, and, and I guess in the UK as well, we, they, we are visibly being affected by some real extreme climatic events. You know, early in the year, Australia suffered from huge bushfires, which essentially closed down some of the cities for, for days and days, absolutely hammering the economic um, progression of these cities. So we can't see um, environment is separate to economy, which I think we've always seen it. We need to see the environment as very much a, a, an important component to creating economic prosperity. And the two are really tied together. So there is a clear direct link between the health of our, of our wild areas and the health of the city. And decision makers globally need to be aware of these dynamics moving forward so that we bring the natural environment into our, our, um, our city environment. And we also rethink how we um, invest in resources and, and I think I guess one key area that we're very much looking at and it links into our biocity um, research is is shifting from a linear economy to a circular economy and and if we can kind of start to do that in our projects um, we're able to then take away that take make waste approach and kind of deposit in our urban in our uh, environment and start to shift to a more circular economy where we can kind of bring in a biological process that um, can actually, um, you know, you, I guess, take some of the waste, but it naturally decomposes. Um, and we can also re retain the circulation of more technical processes, which, which obviously, if you left waste, would kind of wouldn't disappear. So shifting that system requires cities to design out waste and pollution and keep materials and products in use in their continuous manner, which I think is a really exciting challenging area but as, as as urbanists we need to be pushing that because we shouldn't be depositing and leaving waste at the end of our of whatever we do we should be looking at recycling and reusing it and so uh, COVID-19 and climate change really have I think accelerated and emphasized the importance of the natural environment and the importance of multifunctional public space in our cities um, and it's really exposed, uh, maybe it's exposed the, the importance of that, but it's actually exposed society's thirst for that as well, which I think is really exciting. You're not hearing anybody really say, I don't want more open space or I don't want more space to hang out. It's kind of, it's really um, emphasized people's thinking that they want these areas. And so therefore city leaders should act boldly, respond to that demand and really value the importance of social health, well-being, environmental resilience, because that is the key to leading to a more sustainable and pr prosperous economy in the end. Great. Well, Michael, thank you very much. Some uh, splendid points there. Take, make, waste. I should remember that. I mean, the circular economy is something very much supported by Sadiq Khan, the mayor of London. So we're hoping to see much more of that in the years to come once they've sorted out what the new London plan is going to be. So uh, thank you very much for all your comments. Thank you. Great to chat.